we all have some understanding of what junk food is, and perhaps even uh, associate junk food as a feature of neoliberalism. The concept of neoliberal diet, however, is a bit more complex and goes beyond highlighting the energy dense components of food that have become entrenched since the 1980s, popularly known as junk food. Its main point is to emphasize that diets have a class component. Therefore, neoliberal diet uh, refers to both basic and luxury foods. These designations do not imply that one or the other is more or less nutritious. They simply refer to whether they are accessible or not. The neoliberal diet has deepened the class differentiation of foods. The working classes are increasingly exposed to the more energy dense components of diets, while the wealthier classes have increased access to meats, fruits, and vegetables. The latter, fruits and vegetables, are universally considered as the healthiest foods, but they have become luxury foods in the sense that they are more expensive, less accessible than energy dense, nutritionally empty junk food. These are foods containing sugars, refined flour, and fats. Another central component of the neoliberal diet is that one type of meat, chicken, has become a basic food. It is accessible even for a majority of the working classes. And chicken, like beef and pork, is centrally produced using transgenic crops in its feed. Corn and soybeans, biotechnology is the dominant technology of the neoliberal food regime, so its products are ubiquitous through food items like chicken or high fructose corn syrup, which is also used as raw material for many other foods like soft drinks. The diet of the neoliberal food regime tends to make increasing numbers of people fatter, to gain weight and possibly become obese. And obesity is associated with a series of comorbidities like diabetes and hypertension that have tremendously worsened the impact of COVID-19. The medical literature on the relationship between obesity and COVID-19 is unequivocal. Infections are more severe or lethal. Medicine is not my field, but I explored a sample of 25 to 30 medical articles on the association between obesity and COVID-19, and they all found a very strong relation. The articles were on the United States, on China, on Mexico, or they were meta-analyses systematizing the results of many other articles. Obesity and its comorbidities make COVID-19 cases more severe or lethal. Therefore, Mexico and the United States had extremely high rates of COVID-19 deaths, over 100,000 people. These two countries happen to have the highest rates of obesity in the world, with the USA first and Mexico second. Excess deaths rates due to COVID-19, however, were higher in Mexico, perhaps because it is an even more inequitable country and has a weaker medical system. But Mexico, like the United States, was an enthusiastic adopter of neoliberalism along with its food regime. It became economically integrated to its northern neighbor and imports upwards of 60% of its basic food from the United States. Conversely, Mexico's exports of fruit and vegetables to the United States and Canada have grown so much that they have become more expensive in its domestic market. Hence, fruits and vegetables, which used to figure prominently in Mexico's diet until the 1970s, have become luxury foods.
The global social movement Via Campesina advocates food sovereignty and it has strong echo in Mexican social movements. This has been consistent, a consistent call in Mexico's agrarian movements since the 1980s. And it is no coincidence that Mexico achieved its highest level of average per capita food consumption in 1981, when the government had implemented the food self-sufficiency program called Sistema Alimentario Mexicano, SAM for its acronym, uh, or Mexican Food System. This program targeted especially the promotion of basic crops like maize and beans. SAM, the program, included subsidized loans, fertilizers, and technical assistance. At that time, Mexican peasants were still the main providers of basic food, food crops. With trade liberalization at the end of the 1980s, and then joining the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA in 1994, however, Mexico lost both its food sovereignty and its labor sovereignty. Why did it lose its labor sovereignty? Because Mexican bankruptcies resulted in massive numbers of people migrating to the United States in search of a living. Mexico became incapable of affording the majority of its labor force with dignified livelihoods. Consequently, agrarian social movements today, like Sin Maiz No Hay País, meaning without country, or without maize, there's no country, these movements continue to advocate food sovereignty. The self-designated leftist administration of Andres Manuel López Obrador, in power since December 2018, introduced a self-sufficiency program for five food items, maize, beans, wheat, rice, and milk. It's a good start, but judging by the fact that food prices in Mexico are growing twice as fast as general price inflation, much more needs to be done. More focus is needed on promoting the food, the production of fruits and vegetables, especially for schools. Schools, in fact, should provide at least one nutritious meal to children on a daily basis, preferably in association with peasant organizations as their main suppliers. This has been done in Brazil, for instance. To reduce inequality, the government has done two major efforts. One was to significantly increase minimum wages, and this is an ongoing project that has already slightly decreased inequality in Mexico. The other consists of major revisions to the labor legislation. The new labor law sets the conditions for workers to democratize their unions, which have been major vehicles, not for the defense of workers' rights, but for entrenched and corrupt leaders to keep wages and working conditions down. There have been a few significant cases of democratization including the workers uh, at the General Motors plant in Silao, Guanajuato. But sadly, most contracts revised under the new legislation continue to be controlled by the corrupt leaders of the past. Workers will need to strengthen their organizations to get rid of such leadership, democratize unions, and be better prepared to get their fair share of the product. As of 2021, the share of labor compensation of the, from the gross domestic product in Mexico was a mere 35% compared with 65% in Canada and 60% in the United States. Capital is thus taking the lion's share of the GDP. We need a, to change this fundamentally to reduce inequality. <laughs>